Hey, it's that bounce right here. Setting the vibe, setting the tone. Keith McPherson on the fan, KM to AM. Joining me right now is Mr. CP. Don't forget the franchise host of Knicks Fan TV. We got to balance out my Knicks or my Nets talk with some Knicks talk. I reached out to CP. CP, are you there? Loud and clear, Keith. I I like coming into that Blueprint 3. You know, a nice nice little little (laughs) touch with the whole. Shout out to Connor on on the boards, you know. Uh, How you feeling, man? Behind the glass, CG. DJing and dropping the beats. Thanks for joining me, man. Uh, you're somebody in the Knicks world that I look at and I admire because I've seen what you've done on YouTube. I know how hard it is to build a YouTube like that. I know how much time and dedication it it takes to follow the team like you follow the team and cover the team like you follow the team. So glad that you were uh, able to join me. Let's talk some Knicks. Let's talk some Nets. I feel like we're in a state of emergency. <laughs> <laughs> when you have the Knicks losing like this and the Nets losing like this, all the drama surrounding both teams with James Harden's behavior, the rumors with Julius Randle's behavior, the rumors with half the fan base being split on our coaches. Where are you at right now with the Knicks, man? How are you feeling about the Knicks as we are at February 3rd, a week away from the trade deadline? Yeah. Well, you know, last year was a Cinderella story, and this year is back to business as usual. Dysfunction, chaos, and uh, that that's where the Knicks fan dwells best. That's where the Knicks fan dwells best. But, you know, look, man, uh, 24 and 28, certainly not the, the start to the first half of the season that, that you were looking for for this team. It's just been highly inconsistent on both ends of the basketball. Uh, you know, you, you have a point guard rotation that's been in shambles. Kemba Walker was supposed to come here along with Derrick Rose and, and just give you some balance. You know, you're supposed to have 48 minutes of solid point guard play and Rose being down with the ankle injury and Kemba just being largely ineffective ha- has really hurt our team. You have the durability of the bigs. You know, Mitchell Robinson spends his time kind of laboring in, in the first quarter, so trying to get used to coming off of his foot, foot surgery and the weight. Now he's turned things around. New Orleans Noel is now, you know, a, a in and out of the the rotation. So it's just been a lot of inconsistency. But the the primary part of it is uh, the primary reason for for you know the slow start has been the, the play of Julius Randle, man, just not the guy who he was last year. Uh, you you have effort issues with him. His consistency and his effort on the defensive end have been lackluster at times, and the shooting numbers are just way down across the board. So there's just a lot of issues with this team right now. Yeah, I mean, on the net side, there's there's a ton of issues, too. I feel like, you know, the expectations for both teams this year were so high after being the three seed, four seed. You know, coming into this year, there was a lot of hype on both sides, even with the rivalry between the fans. And neither fan base feels like the team is where they want to be right now. How How much of this do you put on Tibbs? How much do you put on the leadership? How much do you you know, watch the games that night and feel like Tibbs should be held more accountable or more responsible or maybe needs to change his approach because the Nets fans are coming for Steve Nash's head lately. Yeah. Yeah, well, listen, man, when you're losing, the coach is always uh, one of the first to take the blame, and and Tibbs can't be spared in this, for sure. You know, when when I look at Tibbs, uh, it's hard to question a coach who has won so many games in the history of this league as he has. But with his second year now, you kind of see his tendencies and and some of the things that he likes to do. And and it sometimes it head scratches. Case in point last night, you know, you, you're going up against an athletic, red hot Grizzlies team, a young and athletic team. You have Kemba Walker out there who's dragging his leg around, you know, really laboring. And he's he's playing almost the entire third quarter. You, you, you're looking for defense. You're looking for stops out there. You have a guy, a young kid like a Miles McBride sitting there on the bench who, you know, no, he's not going to come in and be Kyrie Irving, but he may be a guy that can get you a stop, change the momentum of the game, force some turnovers and, and you know, get us going, get us out in, in transition and, and get us some easier buckets. But, you know, with Thibodeau, his rotations seem stale at times. He, again, you have Kemba Walker playing the entire third quarter. You have Alec Burks in this platoon point guard situation where that's really not his primary skill set. That's not playing him to his strength. You, you're going to an aging veteran like a Taj Gibson. You know, Brooklyn boy, Taj is my guy, but 
Why not a more athletic, young, inspired version of Jericho Sims who's jumping at the gym every time he gets a chance? You know, and also a shot blocker as well. So, you know, Tibbs' rotations have gotten really stale, and there's just no... It doesn't seem to be any adjustments. You know, a lot of teams, you know, seem to adjust in game. Tib seems like a guy who goes into a game with his game plan. He's sticking to it, win or lose. So there's just been some some questionable decisions with the rotations. I feel like the offense could certainly use an offensive coordinator. I think it lacks a lot of thought. You know, our offense a lot of times is, is very much predictable. And so, you know, on a whole, I think Tibbs has a lot of work to do. Yeah, and like when does it shift to the focus being on the young guys, right? When yeah. is it when the, the Knicks are mathematically out of it? Or like when does it shift where Tibbs is like, hey, we got to put these young guys into the fire, see what they got. Yeah. Especially against some of these tough teams that you guys have on the schedule. Like, you know, it's a gauntlet. The Knicks end that schedule with the West Coast trips and some of the opponents that they have back to back and lined up. They did the Knicks and Nets no favors in February at all. But when does Tibbs change to say, hey, we got to get some out of these young guys, see what they got. It's about them. It's not about Julius Randle, Evan Fournier, Kemba Walker, Taj Gibson, Derrick Rose when he comes back. You know, the, the, the interesting dynamic here that we have between what the fans want, what is perceived that the front office may want, and what Tibbs wants. You know, Tibbs is a guy, they made the fourth seed last year, won 41 games. He wants to continue to try to win games. In his mind, the pathway to do so is, quote unquote, with the players that he feels like gives him the best chance to win. Oftentimes, those guys are his veteran players. And and that's the issue because those guys just aren't giving us the best chance. And when I mean those guys, I'm I'm particularly looking at, you know, the Kemba Walkers, the Alec Burks of the world. Give credit to Evan Fournier. They brought him in and and he's really been playing like the guy that they thought they signed. You know, last 10 games, he's averaging 15 points a game, shooting 45% from three on seven attempts. Fournier is starting to lock in and get really comfortable. But the thing with Tibbs is that he's playing for his resume. He's playing for his job, and he feels like that's going to be through wins. And the way he kind of uses some of our younger players is he wants to put them in this box where he feels like, okay, I'm going to put you in for this amount of minutes this quarter because I feel like you're going to succeed in this role right here. He's not a guy that wants to roll the dice and, and, you know, shake things up in the lineup mid-game. And I think that that's part of the issue. They have a tough schedule right now, 24 and 28 right now. They have the third hardest schedule in the league to close out on their way to a West Coast gauntlet, which includes the Lakers. You got back-to-back games against Utah and Denver. Then you go to Golden State. You go to Portland, home against OKC. And then you have Brooklyn, Miami at home, Philly on a back-to-back, at Phoenix, at Clippers. I mean, this schedule is going to get really, really difficult for this team. They're 12th in the East right now. They are one. They are. Where are they from the plane? They're behind the Hawks. They're one and a half games behind the Hawks right now. It, it's only going to get harder. My view is, you know, you still have Cam Reddish here, who he needs to be evaluated. I am not so sure Tibbs turns this thing over to a full youth movement until they're mathematically eliminated. We're going to see what happens at the trade deadline. Will they be able to? You know, um, the, 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 there's so much glut. In, 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 at the point, at the wing, you know, can they find a spot for Alec Burks? Can they, can they find a spot for Kemba Walker that will get some of these younger guys more guaranteed minutes in the rotation? I think it's going to be left to be seen. Yeah, so good. We're talking trade deadline now. You mentioned Alec Burks. You mentioned <laughs> Kemba Walker. Are you a trade Julius Randle guy or you don't think that's going to happen? I don't see them trading him uh, and selling low on Julius Randle. You know, they, they signed him to the max deal, a, a team-friendly max deal, albeit in the offseason. I still believe that, you know, they want to try to make things work with him. I, I don't think they're in much of a panic to trade him just yet. I'm sure if the right offer came along, they would. But Julius Randle's playing so bad right now, you probably have to attach a first-round pick to trade him and, and, and get his salary off the books right now. So I think, you know, it, it's probably best for, for both parties to see if he can I- improve his play and help this team win games. And then maybe you see in the off season or the next trade deadline to see if you can move him. Because right now, I think his stock is so low, you, you, you would just be selling low right now. And I don't think that would be the best move for this organization. So what do you think the Knicks need? I, I'm not 
asking for names of players because people yeah. do that to me all the time. They're like, who should the Nets get? Who do you think the Nets should get? I'm like, bro, I, if I knew exactly who the Nets were targeting or who they would get, I would be working with the Nets in the front office. As a fan, you know, I could tell you the Nets need a shooter. The Nets could use another big, like, whatever it is. What do you think that the, the Knicks are looking for at this trade deadline, right? They got Cam Reddish, and obviously that was to get Knox out of here and to yeah. fit a need. But what do you think they're looking for? What style player or what need needs to be filled? Man, let me tell you, looking from the last season when we were eliminated in the playoffs by the Hawks, I was saying we need a point guard that can help make the game easier for Julius Randle. I thought that when we got Kemba here, that the combination of Kemba and D. Rose, albeit they're, they're near the tail ends of their career, I thought it would still be good enough to really help Julius Randle get open shots, play a little pick and pop for him, guys that could, you know, uh, take some pressure off of him to be, you know, primary ball handlers and, and shot creators. And it just hasn't worked out that way. As, I, as I've said, Kemba's really been a shell of himself. Now, back-to-back zero-point games, he just doesn't look good out there. You have Derrick Rose, who's on the, on the road to recovery from an ankle surgery, but, you know, how much are you really going to put in his hands? We got to go get a point guard. I'm not so sure it's going to come at the deadline. The names we, we've been hearing are Jalen Brunson from the Mavericks. You have the Aaron Fox from the Kings. Uh, right now, what we're hearing is that the, the Mavs feel like uh, they're pretty confident that they can keep Jalen Brunson. He's a guy who's, who's going to be a key cog in their rotation as they make a playoff push, potentially losing Tim Hardaway Jr. for the season with, with a foot injury. Uh, the Sacramento Kings, you know, they were dabbling the Aaron Fox, maybe Tyrese Halliburton in a larger trade for Ben Simmons. You know, they're looking for a real, real game changer for their franchise that could help them make the playoffs. You know, Sacramento Kings haven't been relevant since, you know, Shaq was calling them the Sacramento Queens. You know, when 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 Divac and Chris Webber and Mike Bibby and them are running up and down. So they're looking for a big splash. I don't necessarily think they they make Fox available, but, you know, we, we need a, a young downhill go get them point guard. I, I'm just not sure that that's available at the deadline. Another area I would look at. You know, we address the wing depth with Cam Reddish. Hopefully we get to see some of him before the season is over. But uh, a stretch five, I think, would would help this team in, in a, a great deal. I think it would help open things up for both Julius Randle and R.J. Barrett and, and you know, provide us with some spacing, much-needed spacing in our starting unit, which oftentimes gets really, really bogged down, especially in the half court. Uh, Miles Turner was a name that, that you were hearing. Indiana was looking to trade Turner, Sabonis, and Levert. I'm not sure the Knicks would be willing to to spend uh, what it's going to take to acquire Turner. Not to mention that you know he's making he's got a pretty sizable contract as well. But I think a stretch five that can maybe come off the bench and play in instead of a Taj Gibson again that can really help uh, spread the floor for you. Give Mitchell Robinson a spell and and change the offensive dynamic a little bit. Those are the two positions I'd be looking at: point and uh, and, and stretch five. Is it too early to be thinking about the draft and the lottery for the Knicks? Man, let me tell you, after they get back from this West Coast trip, I'm going to have to dust off the fatigues, man, because we might have to start the tank up. That's that's uh, <laughs> that's how dreadful this thing could be because, I, you know, I think the Lakers is certainly a winnable game, but when you're looking at Utah and Denver on back-to-backs, two places where we have traditionally, historically not played well, then you got to go to San Francisco. You know Steph is going to be looking to bury us. I think this West Coast trip is, is really going to be an arduous task for us, both uh, physically and, and mentally. Um, but we'll see. You know, we'll see. I think Tibbs is still holding out hope that this team can can get it together uh, and, and make a quick run. Maybe it's a play-in game. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we end up seeing the Nets in a, in a play-in series. <laughs> and then uh, maybe that supercharges things. So uh, we'll see what happens when they get back out west. But I, I think it's starting to get late early, as, as Yogi Berra would say, man. Yeah, bro. I mean, with this West Coast trip for the Nets, we, we've got Nets fans talking about, we're going to be in the play-in. It's been a gauntlet. It's been rough. I told people we got to weather the storm. They still don't understand, like, this isn't done. We have to face the Jazz and the Nuggets. And we just played the Nuggets in Brooklyn. And, you know, they're a good team. They they didn't have to do too much to beat us. Like, we, we ran with them. But, you know, they sat Jokic for a bunch of time. And, you know, they played about 12 guys, it, it seemed like. And they just handled us and, and got the win. Obviously, James Harden was sitting out. But... All right, man, last thing, you know, we were talking about, I think one of the callers was, was talking about how, you know, the Knicks don't need to worry about winning. They've got the Garden. They've got the Mecca. They've got uh, Walt Clyde Frazier. 
Mike Breen, uh, you know, they, they run the town. They got the most fans. And I'm like, well, after last year, mixing that with victory and seeing how the Knicks fans came alive in this city, what makes you think that Knicks fans want to go back to just, like, bragging about their fandom and their arena? Like, if you pair that with a good team, a good product, a young team that can consistently win moving forward, the Knicks and the fan base will be on steroids. Like that's got to be the goal. I can't. I don't understand any Knicks fans that's just content with all the years of losing, especially after you got a taste of winning and being in the playoffs last season. Man, man, let me tell you something. As I do these post game shows on on uh, our Knicks fan TV, and and you you hear the sentiments and the reactions from the fans. Last year was like a drug. You know, making making the fourth seed. We beat the Hawks in game two. I mean, it was damn near a parade outside of Madison Square Garden. I was out there. It was a party out there. It was absolutely electric. And this year, the all the losing has uh, it's led to a lot of infighting on Nick's Twitter. The fan base is divided. It's like a Royal Rumble on Twitter every night. You know, you got trade this guy, get rid of Tibbs, fire Tibbs. Oh, this fan base. They're hungry for a winner, you know, and and most importantly, they're, they're hungry for a team that they can be proud of. There's been too many games this year where even the coach has called out the team for their lack of intensity and lack of effort. And, and that's just one thing, win or lose, we're just not going to be, as a fan base, we just don't like. We we want guys that are going to put it out there every night and, and give it their best effort. And so that has to be the, the basis. That has to be the basis and the focal point of our culture. But this year, it, it just hasn't been there. So there, there's no doubt this fan base is starving for a winner. Uh, I don't know if they can turn it around this year, but we'll we'll have to see what happens. Wednesday, February 16th, Brooklyn Nets, <laughs> New York Knicks in the garden. If your Knicks steal that one, I know we won't hear the end of it. And the way that it's looking, bro, the Nets aren't going to have KD. They aren't going to have Kyrie. Nope. They aren't going to have Joe Harris. And I'm saying the Nets have to make a trade to get hey. a shooter or somebody else to be next to James Harden because we can't rely on James Harden and Patty Mills and Blake Griffin. Like, but Marcus Aldridge might be out, too. He just sprained his ankle uh, over the weekend. With the way that the Nets are cautious, he's not going to be back uh, ready to go by February 16th. I have that date circled. We'll have to have you call back in and come back Let's on either it. before that one or after that one because. That one's going to flip the city upside down if the Knicks can get that win. It won't matter what happens out west. It won't matter about a losing streak, uh, rough times. I know Knicks fans are, are, are circling that date as well as Nets fans, and uh, we'll have you back on to talk about that one soon, bro. Hey, I'm down, man, and I'm, I'm hearing James Harden's looking for some real estate in Philly, man, so his mind might not be, his focus <laughs> just might not be there, you know what I'm saying? But, hey, I, I like a little bit of Nets dis- dysfunction, man, so anytime you need me back, I'm, I'm always uh, ready to go, man. Hey, appreciate you, my guy, CP. Don't forget the franchise, Knicks Fan TV, right here on The Fan. Thanks for joining us, bro. Keith, thanks again, man. Have a good night. 